Hey everybody. So hey. I'm, I'm Fred Heron, and uh, let me start by saying I'm an evangelical Christian. Sorry, that's the worst kind. And uh, I was taught <laughs> to uh, believe in I was taught to believe in Croatianism, and uh, all, all the way from my childhood, and I, I preached it. And um, that's not really me, but uh, <laughs> I there got the mojo going. No. <laughs> <laughs> all the way through Christian college, I was taught Croatianism, and uh, I believed it. I preached it. So let me tell you what changed my mind. It's a mind which, that I really didn't want to change because it meant I had to throw away a whole book that I had written and start over. Uh, I was doing uh, book tours in other countries for a first book that I had written all about modern cosmology called Show Me God. You're gonna, you're gonna be looking around me the whole time. You feel, feel free to move around if I'm in front of you. So, um, so it was called Show Me God and uh, I took advantage of the opportunity to visit paleontologists at their fossil sites for the next book that I was planning and started doing that then. And that eventually became a problem because uh, I've been taught that there are no transitions in the fossil record, no macro evolution. However, over the years, as I became a science journalist, I went visiting paleontologists at fossil sites in Africa, in Asia, in North America, in South America, in Europe. And what I found being dug up or eroding out of the ground and seeing with my own eyes was nothing but transitions. And all the places where I've been told that scientists would never find transitions, I found myself writing science news stories about the discoveries of those transitions. Now, we can all agree that there is evidence in the fossil record all over the planet that the farther down we dig, fossilized organisms, we gradually, we see there are gradually looking less and less like today's creatures, right? Until we find a world of creatures that looks completely unlike anything that we see on the planet today. If we start with our own chordate lineage, which first appears in the early Cambrian period, 530 million years ago, I saw something that my intelligent design friends said scientists would never find because this would be macroevolution. This transition from invertebrates to vertebrates in this case, which, which is a huge gap. But it's filled in, and it's something that I saw when visiting uh, Professor Yuan Chen in southern China's Yunnan province at Chenzhen, uh, the early Cambrian site we had discovered Yunnanozoan the year before, and um, Haikawala Lancelot, hundreds of specimens the year that I was there. And I'll get to that in a second, I'll show you where those are. <coughs> that's that's uh, John Yuan at the top. So as we go up the geologic column, we come finally then to the Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs, where you can see the transitions across three periods of uh, various clades of dinosaurs branching into new clades. And I visited scientists who studied the sauropod dinosaurs, those with the long necks and the small heads, the dinosaurs, not the scientists. <laughs> and so by the Cretaceous, these were the biggest creatures ever to walk the planet. But I found that these four-legged giants actually form a sequence that starts way back in the mid-Triassic with bipedal little guys. But as you go up into higher strata, we see, that we see them going from small sauropodomorphs, see them at the bottom there, to the, uh, to the core prosauropods, to the near sauropods, and all the way up at the top of the geologic column or of, the, of the periods of the dinosaurs, the top of the Cretaceous, we see the true sauropods. And we see the accumulation of changes that allow their limbs to take more weight for them to walk <coughs> more, more on all fours. We can actually see the, the radius and the ulna becoming fused together uh, in their forelimbs to support more weight as they began, began to spend more time on all fours. And we can follow the evolution of the mantis, the hand, uh, as the digits arrange themselves become more columnar, the more tubular to support all that weight as they became quadrupedal. Um, but you might ask, aren't scientists just assuming that these sequences are actual lineages related to each other by common descent? Well, uh, geographical distribution uh, of each of these sequences also argues for descent with modification. Um, when we combine this with our knowledge of plate tectonics, what we see is You'll notice here this little animation. We've got uh, all the Pangaea with Laurasia going up in the north and Gondwana forming in the south and the rift right here between forming up the Atlantic. We've got dinosaurs on this side and this side, the sauropods that are in the same families. And then as they split apart, even though we can find them today in Morocco over here and uh, South America over here, same exact dinosaurs. Then as time goes by, we see them becoming less and less like the ones on the other side of this great divide of the Atlantic Ocean. And we see the same thing with uh, the same kinds of dinosaurs in the bottom of South America back when it was um, attached to Antarctica. So there's a good evidence for, not only for plate tectonics, but again for common ancestry. We have more evidence from cladistics. Now paleontologists classify organisms into groups called clades. 
not according to any evolutionary assumptions of common ancestry, but according to the number of characters that organisms share. And when they classify all these dinosaurs according to shared derived characters and put all the data into a computer, they end up with a cladogram. And it will show which animals are most closely related to which. No evolutionary assumptions, again, are involved yet. But when you look at the sequences that naturally form, and then when you line up that with a fossil record, and see if these animals see their relative position to one another, above or below one another in the strata, these fossil stratigraphic sequences match the sequences that formed in the cladogram, showing that these characters did indeed build on top of each other over time, which is the evolutionary picture of descent with modification, once again. Um, of uh, one feature building on top of another, another building on top of that over time. The fossil record matches what the cladograms predict. And we see these kinds of sequences for all the major groups of animals. So we see that transition from the fish to the tetrapods. We see that in the details, the lobe fins to legs with uh, tiktalic and tichthyostega found in recent years. We see the transition from reptiles to mammals with a family called Brazilidontidae. Jose Bonaparte in Buenos Aires showed me the details of the transitions happening in the ear, the teeth, and in the crania. And uh, in the strata representing the most recent 60 million years, paleontologists have been finding fossils <coughs> showing the transitional sequence from terrestrial tetrapods, four-footed animals, land animals, to whales. Transitions which I was told 15 years ago by intelligent design leaders would never be found. So what should I conclude? Let's just say that I threw away the book that I wrote trying to refute evolution, and I've been working on a new one ever since that tries to be more careful with the evidence. Of course, what we're most interested in is us. Do we see the same evidence for evolution in the case of humans? Well, I look particularly closely into that question from the earliest hominids of early modern humans, um, visiting some of the uh, world's most inaccessible fossil sites, requiring cave diving in Romania and long days in baking deserts in Kenya. If the scientists were to make this stuff up, they could have found easier ways to do it, believe me. But some of what I found on the evolution of humans, um, specimens fall naturally into chronological order to form lineages from small-brained, ape-like bipeds to modern humans, from artifacts Artificus cadaver to Artificus rabidus to Artificus anamensis to Australopithecus afarensis to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Archaic Homo sapiens to Homo sapiens. Some of these being ancestral to us and some of them being branches uh, that went extinct. In addition, um, the modern human body has many vestiges of parts that look exactly as if they are remnants of our non human ancestors, including human wisdom teeth, goosebumps, uh, the tailbone, and so on. In our DNA, we have vestiges of a gene that produces an enzyme that synthesizes vitamin C, but it no longer functions in us. It's broken. But uh, clearly, it's in the same place and contains the same sequences that we find in monkeys and other mammals that do make their own vitamin C, showing our common descent with them from earlier primates. Again, there'd be no reason for an intelligent designer to create the same sequence, now non-functioning, unless he used evolution to create us, or unless he wished to deceive us into thinking these were remnants of our ancestors. And we see these types of vestigial structures in today's vestigial leg bones and pythons and boas. We see a vestigial pelvis and femur in modern whales. And we come to the evidence from Evo Debo, evolutionary developmental biology. Development is the study of how individuals are biologically equipped to grow from a single cell through all the stages to adulthood. Um, how does that happen? Regulatory genes can switch on the development of whole organs, sometimes whole appendages. Apparently, nature has selected mutations that use these same genetic switches to make permanent phylogenetic changes as seen in the fossil record. Simple switches may reshape, or fuse, or lengthen, or even duplicate a bone. But we might skeptically ask, how will mutations for the necessary nerves and veins and muscle to support this bone all happen at the same time? Regulatory development shows how it happened to each of you as you were growing up as an embryo. In development, it happens through something called exploratory behavior. In, uh, for the developing limb, nerves grow out all over the place from the brain and the spinal cord, and they commit cell suicide unless they reach target areas that provide survival factor. Blood vessels sprout and branch off existing vessels to reach every tissue that needs oxygen and gives off the signaling um, growth factor. Muscles migrate out from the trunk, taking exploratory paths until they find local cues in bones and cartilage. And the point is you didn't even need every minute um, vein mapped out in advance to get the job done. Uh, it turns out nature is extremely economical in terms of maximizing the effects of a single mutation and in terms of the, the number of genes required to make a genome. And this explains why the human genome is so similar to the mouse genome, and for that matter, to the bacteria. 
um, because the core exons stay the same over millions of years while the action is in the regulatory genes, in the vast stretches of DNA that used to be thought of as being junk. So evolution doesn't require a lot of complex and specified information. Origin of life might, but that's a different subject. Rather, cells are designed not just to sit there and for some supernatural magical poof. They're designed to give out growth factors and other signals that draw nearby nerves and vessels and muscles to, to generate branches toward them. So geneticists have learned uh, that one of the more likely paths evolution will take is to allow a change through a mutation in the DNA regulatory sequence. God's ways in creating the diversity of life we see are certainly far beyond the rigid, immutable, human design analogy-based kinds of design that most Christians are familiar with. The actual design science is uncovering is much more adaptable, more creative, more flexible, more robust, more long-lasting, more economical. And I have to say more giving, that is less stingy and more providing to a creature of everything they're going to need, certainly far beyond any design analogy that we can, that we can make so far with current human engineering. Where if you change one part of the mechanical watch and one part breaks down, the whole thing stops working. Life, in contrast, is optimized for change. It's adaptable, it's evolvable. The choice between the evolution and creation then, if nothing else, what we should be clear, what should be clear to both, both atheists and to Christians here from all of this is that you don't have to choose between evolution and God. If God exists and if science shows us evolution, God used evolution to create. All right, let me talk to Christians about evolution and the Bible. Um, I found that when I avoided the three following errors, I no longer started with an evol anti evolution agenda. And I could let the scientific evidence lead me in matters of science, and I could let the Bible lead me in matters of God's message. And the first uh, error to avoid is reading modern, reading modern science into ancient scripture. Knowledgeable Christians read out from the text what's there, reading out exegesis as opposed to reading into the text what you want to find there, eisegesis. Um, Paul urges Timothy to, to, of course, to study, to rightly handle the word of truth. In the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart say, a text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or to his or her readers. We know that modern science has developed in the last uh, three or 400 years, so we know that the ancient Bible writers, <coughs> writing 2,000 to 2,500 years ago, weren't addressing scientific concerns about genetics or the Big Bang or billions of years or evolution versus creation. Science is about discovery, discoveries that humans make. If God revealed science, it wouldn't be science. It would be revelation. <coughs> the distinction, this distinction should be important for people who have a high view of the inspiration of the scriptures. The Bible is one ancient source of claimed divine revelation that encourages us to use our own heads and to seek knowledge of the natural world, not to expect science or technology to come as a direct gift from above. Very unlike uh, the Sumerian Inanna or the Greek Prometheus, stealing fire and metallurgy and music and arts of civilization from the gods to bring them to humans. We're told that God made us in his image and gave us dominion to use and to care for the earth and life on it. And God doesn't tell us to look for omens in the skies or to his inspired prophets to get technology. He just tells us, look for understanding as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, Proverbs 2, 4. Choose knowledge rather than choice gold, Proverbs 8, 10. Wise men store up knowledge, Proverbs 10, 14. <coughs> God's works are studied by all who delight in them, Psalm 111, 2. So it's ironic that some Christians should return to this pagan way of looking to Revelation to bypass all the hard work and hard study of the natural world, and that they should look instead to the Bible to confirm their anti-evolution bias and then feel justified to read that bias into their version of science. One of those Christianized versions of science has become known as intelligent design. So my, my second error to avoid is assuming that we should recognize God's design in nature by its resemblance to human designs, as if his ways are like our ways. Scripture doesn't teach us to identify God's hand in nature by looking for where we see designs that look like the way we design things, as if God is just like us, only bigger, like the Greeks and Romans thought about their gods. But in fact, it tells us rather that God's ways are beyond and above our ways of doing and thinking. <coughs> Read that verse for yourself. I'll try to save time. And uh, the last error to avoid is to assume that we should recognize God's involvement in nature by his interventions in it, his breaking of his laws, rather than crediting him for and praising him for nature just as we find it. This causes ID advocates to miss God's glorious work through his natural laws, as if nature is just not as cool as the supernatural. 
But the psalmist tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, not God's interference with the heavens or his interruption of any part of nature. Nature itself declares God's glory, just as we find it, not the interruption. <clears throat> In 1837, long before modern creationists or ID leaders came along to tell us how to recognize divine design in their reaction to their enemy, Darwin, a prominent Christian and scientist, Charles Babbage, wrote this in his ninth Bridgewater Treatise. He says, many excellent religious persons, not deeply versed in human knowledge, have endeavored to discover the truths of design and have represented the deity as perpetually interfering to alter for a time the laws he had previously ordained, thus by implication denying to him the profession of that foresight which is the highest attribute of omnipotence. Let me um, close with a thought for um, atheists and a thought for Christians. Can, um, I, can I close with a thought for, for atheists and Christians? Say, we, we yeah, want to go for, it. Uh, for Christians, I'd encourage us to be less restrictive in the way we consider God's handiwork. God's designs can be far beyond our inflexible, short-lived designs, and ask yourself, does it make more sense for God to use magic to create like a wizard with magical proofs or to use laws and processes that nature itself might be the miracle? For atheists, what if the real God is more like Richard Dawkins' idea with just enough room at the end of the seven point Dawkins scale theistic probability for a God that is far beyond and greater than any of our descriptions we humans have come up with on our own? What if the real God is like this greater than we can imagine idea that Dawkins speaks of as well as the Isaiah 55 description of a God whose ways and thoughts are far beyond ours. I'd ask my atheist friends to consider whether we must assume that such a first cause beyond our ability is beyond our ability uh, that although this God is beyond our ability to comprehend, assume that he must be so limited that it would be incapable of uh, making itself at least partly known to us, communicating to us on our level about the things that matter most. Thanks for your kind attention. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's make use of our time if we've got two or three minutes for me to hook up. If you have a question for Fred, why don't you ask it while I'm getting ready? Uh, yeah. Um, how do you, um, where, how do you reconcile, I'm just curious about, I'm a Christian too, um, I'm curious where you, I'm trying to let it <laughs> Um, let's see. Well, I'm also the worst guy, I think, too. I'm <laughs> but anyway, um, the part where the Bible, where it says, um, for each to take after its own kind and its seed, what is your uh, take on that? Right. And I, think, I think the uh, scripture writer at that point was um, using the best understanding they had at that time. But what I know for sure is that he wasn't addressing the modern controversy of evolution versus creation and whether animals were uh, changing over time to become different kinds of animals. That makes sense to us today because it sort of fits what our controversy is all about, but I don't think that was even on his mind. Okay. Okay. You yeah. to go real fast. Yeah. I'm going to ask Trump to go here. real fast. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do the best I can. Where Fred and I would disagree, Fred sees things more like a forensic scientist, let's say, where he's looking at the after effects and he's measuring it to come to conclusions on how he sees development. What I'm going to talk about tonight is actual being a statistician and a mathematician, being a scientist who runs experiments, I'm going to talk about actually running and observing how life works today. Um, so let me throw this at you, a couple examples. Make sure we're grounded in what Fred talked about, evolution. You know, you've got to make sure you understand it. If we mean change over time, no big deal. Of course, everything <coughs> change over time. When we think about this idea of common descent, uh, this would be more like the intelligent design people would think about microevolution, they call it, where you have variability within a species. Okay, I don't really have much trouble with that. I think there's a lot of good evidence for that. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about, or I would be more con contending against. It would be this one. This is probably more of what Fred was saying as well. All ordered complex living creatures, including me, a product of billions of years of unguided events, which work together <coughs> to produce design and order from a starting point of simplicity or randomness. We would call that more of Darwin's or today's scientific community's definition of this macroevolution. And Darwin's theory, and a lot of what's taught of, Devo, Devo is fairly new. It's not, it hasn't been along, around a long time. Most of what's taught in our schools will have to do with natural selection and genetic mutations. So this is what I would be talking about. What do they mean by natural selection when people use that term? Darwin's theory talks about if you have high reproductive ability, but you're restricted in your environment, you would have 
breeding but nowhere to go. So it becomes more of a competition. Some are going to survive, some aren't. Through that comp competition, you have genetic information that randomly is going to get passed on because some compete better for the resources. And through the progeny, it's going to be passed on to the next generation. And as time goes on, what happens is it becomes adaptive genetically. And those small changes over time now in the offspring, as time goes on, actually lead to a whole new kind of species. So it's not variation within the finch family. It's going from a reptile to a bird, or it's, it's literally a change completely in morphology, which is really what Fred was talking about, the anatomy or structure that he sees in his evidence. Now, the original title that he had for Origin of Species was really the preservation of favored re uh, races in the struggle for life. So Darwinian Origin of Species is really talking about competition, um, survival, the struggle for existence. Now, for me, this is where I fall off. Being a statistician and an engineer, when you look at the precision that you see in life systems, whether it's biochemical, whether it's the universe, whether it's just in the smallest particles, and it's repetitive, so it's not just chance based on one measurement, it's a repetitive experiments, the precision screams for a deliberate act. When you look at some people like William uh, uh, <coughs> Werner von Braun, where he talks about to be forced to believe one conclusion. In other words, for kids to be taught one way as though it's science and not look at other views um, violates the very objectivity of science. What that means is you should be allowed to think and observe and weigh different opinions. Uh, what random process could possibly produce the brains of a man or the human eye? Fred Hoyle, one of the most famous examples, went from atheism and agnosticism just by studying the carbon atom <coughs> and the precision it takes for the three heliums to form. And he talked about how absurd it is to look at life and realize the property of physics are so finely designed that it's almost deliberate. And to not open that up for discussion is, is almost psychological rather than scientific. In other words, not to allow that discussion in a free market. So I'm going to run you through three examples. One of them, if you look at just the design of the animal kingdom. When, again, when Fred, this is, this is uh, when someone goes first, you get to talk about what he did, what he talked about, you know? So again, he's looking at the evidence for structures, putting a case together for what he sees. Here, when you look within the biochemistry of systems, and you see the precision there, it argues for a mind. <laughs> it argues for something beyond just chance unguided process. And for me, when I look at, again, when I study the Bible, being a Christian, I see in the Bible where God talks about it openly, about go and observe animals, look at the animal kingdom, understand them, and they'll tell you and teach you about who he is. Example, giraffes. There's a million examples like this. I say a million, I've got about 50 that I go through. <laughs> when I look at the giraffe, 70 to 20 feet tall, uh, human being about six feet, um, the, the whole thought there when you look at evolutionary theory is that the giraffe started not with a long neck. Through a sequence of events, the neck grew as the animal progressed in different stages. The problem with that, the giraffe's heart weighs about 25 pounds. Okay, the heart is about two and a half feet long. It's huge. The human heart's about a pound and a half, and it's about six inches. If the giraffe started at that size and with that heart, it would blow its brains out. It wouldn't be able to exist. So you'd have to try to understand how could a heart that strong evolve with the giraffe's neck? You see, if it's the same size as a human being, it has to be roughly the same size for the pumping capacity of blood. If it's too big, it's literally going to blow its brains out. So the heart would have to actually evolve with the neck. When you ask evolutionists or scientists, can you explain that? The answer is no, it just might have happened. And you want scientific reasoning, not storytelling. So the second question is, how do you explain blood regulation then? How does the blood flow 
with a heart size so different in such different size animals. <coughs> the giraffe has an amazing system. Whether the giraffe is reaching up or whether it's bending down, it has a reticulum system of nine valves along its <coughs> neck. When it's standing up, the valves open and it pumps blood three times faster than a human so that its brain can function. And it doesn't faint by just raising its head. <coughs> the problem is if it did the same thing when it stooped down, it blow its brains out. It has a nine valve system. The nine valve system has to function perfectly <coughs> to attenuate the flow of blood. If one of those valves doesn't work, the pressure's too great, it blows its brains out. So you have to stop and think, how did the valve system design? Where'd that come from? It couldn't evolve sequentially over time. If it, if it was designed at first with six out of seven, or just three out of eight, it's dead. How did that get passed on to progeny? There's no scientific answer for that. When we think about bio com uh, the complexity of <coughs> biochemical life, here we're talking about irreducible complexity. And what that means is every part of a system has to be there all together at the same time. You can't be missing anything. In the Bible, God, des God describes that a human being is designed from the inside to be able to function. And it's designed all at the same time. So I'll give you an example. When we think about our eye, this is one of the favorite things evolutionists like to talk about is a poor design in the eye, but nobody ever talks about biochemistry in the eye. The retina on the back is where everything happens. The retina is where you have the photosensitive cells that capture light and transmit it into an electrical signal that you see through your head, your brain. You really see with your brain, not with your eyes. It's the most complex organ next to your brain in the human body. It, it actually takes light, turns it into electricity. It's crazy. So, how does that work? There's a series of protons, uh, proteins, a series of proteins that have to trigger together in a transfer function, or an actual equation, that work together. It starts with 11 CTS retinol, and when the photon of light hits 11 CTS retinol, it changes shape. When it changes shape, rhodopsin, a separate protein can now change shape. The two bond together and form metarhodopsin 2. When metarhodopsin 2 forms, you know what happens next? Another protein called GDP is triggered now, so it can go out and <coughs> bond. When it bonds, GTP, a separate protein, has to drop off. When it drops off, the concentration of CGMP, another protein, takes effect. It gets lower, like pulling a plug in a bathtub. When that happens, now all of a sudden the ion channel closes and you get an electrical signal because the sodium ion level shifts. When that shifts, you get an electric current and now you see it. If any one of those proteins wasn't lined up in an equation to act or be triggered by the previous protein, you never see it. None of these can happen by chance. They have to happen the same way every time or you don't see. The problem we have with vision is we always look at anatomy, like Fred was talking about, he looks at structures and anatomy. If you look at the biochemistry, it's a whole different story. If you want to look at it visually, here's what it looks like. Proton hits 11 CTS retinol, changes shape, rhodopsin changes with it, forms metarhodopsin 2. That triggers transducin the link, which then drops off GDP, which then causes GTP to come on. Until GTP comes on, phosphodiesterase then won't be triggered to join, but once it's triggered to join, CGMP drops, you get sodium ion level go down, you get an electrical signal, and you see. That happens a billionth of a second over and over again right now while we're talking. If it doesn't happen like that, you don't see. That's, that's right now, it's about a tenth of a second I just did. I do differential equation solutions in my work. This is what I do for a living where I take data and I have to develop equations. <clears throat> this right here, they try to model and simulate to make it work. They can't do it. It's impossible to recreate ourselves as scientists and engineers what goes on in your eye every second according to an equation. How on earth did that happen naturally? Last one, DNA. I gotta go fast because I know I'm running out of time. We look at DNA and this is where we have specified information. 
specified information in the Hebrew the word form means literally that God put information in form uh, animal life and human beings. That's what that means in the, in the Hebrew. It's a literal code. So inside the cell of the nucleus, you have a code that's not like digital code for computer. Computer code is just two digits. It's just a zero or a one. DNA code is four. You've got the four base pairs. They're always the same. Guanine and cytosine, adenine and thymine. But the, the amazing thing about DNA is how complex and orderly it is. It's a literal language that's coded, three million base pairs set up exactly for the specific type of life that's going to come into existence. When you look at it, <coughs> literally every life form has a different strand of DNA, and it's a literal blueprint. Whether your hair color is blonde <coughs> or brown, your eye color, everything is coded like a machine language defining who you are. When you look at Bill Gates, it's like a machine code, but more advanced than any software that's ever been written. That's how, that's how amazing it is. And that's exactly when you look at the Bible, when God talks about the Psalms fashioning you, what he's talking about in the Hebrew, he literally frames you. And when he talks about weaving, putting you together, it's embroidery. He knits you the way you are. It's the details of human life we see in biochemistry. And here's the last thing I'll end on, the paradox we have of replication. You see, the proteins I talked to you about in the eye, they came from DNA as it replicated out of cells in the nucleus through messenger RNA. DNA literally knows how to unwind itself. Other nu nucleotides come in, and DNA actually reproduces <coughs> itself to form each unique protein that the body needs. So 11 CTS ret retinals of protein, it's fabricated by DNA within the cell as it goes ahead and builds the cells you need to form a human being. A human being is formed by cells, by the structure in the nucleus. And here's the crazy thing. DNA can't exist without proteins. You have to have proteins to have DNA, but the problem is proteins can't be formed or organized without DNA. So you need proteins for DNA, and yet D DNA can't exist without them. So the problem is they had to come together at the same time, just by cause and effect. You can't have a cause that exists before its effect. The only way you can get DNA and proteins is if they came to existence at the same time. The problem is you need DNA to make proteins. So something had to put them here together at one time. That's called creation. Something that came to be that didn't exist. How am I doing? You got 30 seconds. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> now that's the cell code. How about processing? <laughs> you say how crazy a cell is. I just talked about DNA for the code. That's just a blueprint that designed you. The cell is nuts. The cell's a little city. It's a little factory. And what's happening is the cell is each of the parts that are being designed are moved around this factory to fit in according to where the work is done. Uh. The nucleus <laughs> is the cell at City Hall. The mitochondria is a power plant. See, just how it's not so tough. The ribosomes are the factory that makes new products. All right, wrap it up. God oh, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Now we have JJ coming up, and we'll take questions here shortly. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's so generous here. Thank you all for having us here. This is a very, very cool process. Now, as you can imagine from Fred's presentation earlier, I'm sure you all want to look at the blue screen, so stand here. <laughs> he gave a lot of interesting evidence towards his position, and <coughs> Ed gave a lot of very interesting evidence towards his position. It's massive. The amount of evidence for both sides, for both positions, is massive. There's a lot of data and a lot of interpretation of that data. And so when I come to my conclusions about my perspective, 
which I am supportive of macroevolution as a, a overarching process. I do so not because of just my understanding and interpretation of the data, but because I look for a consensus on that interpretation of the data. By a show of hands, how many of you people have ever heard of Project Steve? Let me tell you more. <laughs> Project Steve is a list, a list of scientists, almost all of whom who have PhDs, who have signed their name to this statement, which says, quote, evolution is a vital, well-supported, unifying principle of the biological sciences, and the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of the idea that all living things share a common ancestry. Although there are legitimate debates about the patterns and processes of evolution, there is no serious scientific doubt that evolution occurred or that natural selection is a major mechanism in its occurrence. It is scientifically inappropriate and pedagogically irresponsible for creationist pseudoscience, including but not limited to intelligent design, to be introduced into the science curricula of our nation's public schools." Unquote. For some, the theory of evolution is a theory in crisis. However, in the scientific community, the theory of evolution is overwhelmingly accepted. Come, in America, about 1% of the population goes by some variant of the name Steve. Now remember that, 1%. On Project Steve, which began February 16, 2003, and as of November 17, 2014, there are 1,357 Steves, or variants, who have signed this document. Now this idea was not original to the National Center of Science Education. They get that idea from a list compiled by the Discovery Institute. Who's heard of the Discovery Institute? All right. On the website, Dissent from Darwin, they compiled their own list of scientists who signed the Dissenting from Darwin statement. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. It has just topped 840 signatories. The statement was drafted in 2001. There are no naming restrictions applied to this particular statement. So now do a few things real quick in your head. Recall that Steve or a variation of it comprises 1% of names in America. <coughs> Note that in two years less than the life of the Descent from Darwin org statement, Project Steve has 60% more signatures. And according to David Bailey on his blog on April 12, 2013, he writes, as of April 2012, the NCSE list has 2,002 names compared with 840 on the other. If we count only those persons on these two lists who have a PhD degree or a professional position in a core field closely related to evolution, anatomy, anthropology, biochemistry, biology, biophysics, botany, ecology, entomology, and genetics, geology, geophysics, microbiology, neurophysiology, paleontology, physiology, or zoology, who thus are particularly well qualified to make such a declaration, then 708 of the names on the NCSE list, the Steve list, were so qualified compared with only 258 of the Discovery Institute list. That's right, in biology-related fields, for every one scientist that is skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life, there are 2.74 scientists named Steve. And remember the fact from the beginning how Steve comprises about 1% of all the names in America? Well, that means for every one dissenting scientist in a field related to biology, there are 274 scientists and professionals in the affirmative who specialize in the field. 274 to 1. We need a picture. Fred, would you be kind enough to help me? I was going to do this on this board, but it's not long enough. Yeah. Hold this. One hand, uh, right hand for that. Left hand for this. Hold it at the one inch mark, please. For every inch of scientist that descends, that descends from the evolutionary theory, and we use an inch to represent every scientist that supports evolutionary theory. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. That's the difference. The marker at the one inch point and this marker here. That is the preponderance of support you find by people who make their living studying this 
and not just studying it academically. <coughs> I borrowed this. I'm technologically insufficient. <coughs> That's the measure of support. Of course, none of this should matter. None of the signatories of Project Steve believe science is conducted by vote. There is no doubt among them that science is conducted by research, tested research. And the more research that is built onto and out from any theory, that theory becomes more robust. None of us here doubts the theory of gravity or atomic theory or the theory of plate tectonics, as Kuinky Dink. We do not doubt them because of the supporting research conducted that has made these theories robust. The robustness of this research is measured in peer review. On PubMed, there are 391,034 articles related to evolution. Exactly zero of these articles calls into question the theory of evolution. Zero of them. Natural selection, in quotes, minus computer, yields 1.67 million scholarly articles at yeoldscholar.google.com. On the first page alone, the 10 results listed have been cited by other research work 66,054 times as of Sunday night. Because it's not just about the number of articles that have been published on a subject, that's alone not enough to be good science. Anybody with a pen can go out and write about data and presupposition and bias and real research and more data and fact and interpretation. Science goes beyond the mere pen of an individual. It measures that individual's work by how useful that work is to the work of others. That's why citations are important. A paper that is cited 100 times has knowledge that has been found to reproduce results in the work of others, 100 others ideally. Sometimes this is not the case. The Discovery Institute list is one of their peer-reviewed papers that supports intelligent design. Wolf Eckhart Luning, Mutations, the Law of Recurrent Variation, Floriculture, Ornamental, and Plant Biotechnology. A couple of things. Notice that it's a floriculture journal. And two, the law of recurrent variation, this is a law that learning thought up, doesn't meet the definition of law that mainstream science uses. And his paper has been cited four times by him. Now look at these numbers. 66,054 citations for the first 10 articles. I pulled the first 10 articles on the Discovery Institute's collection of peer-reviewed research that supports intelligent design. 244 citations. 274 scientists for the theory of evolution to one against. 391,034 to zero papers in support of evolution on PubMed's database. <coughs> Why is this important? Let me remind you one of the first points I brought up talking about Project Steve. It was a tongue-in-cheek project to show that there is no controversy within the scientific community <coughs> as to whether or not the theory of evolution was a controversy in the realm of science. It is not. So not. At least according to Funny2.com, your odds of dating a millionaire at 215 to 1, your odds of being on a plane with a drunken pilot at 117 to 1, your odds of being audited by the IRS at 175 to 1 are better than finding a scientist in the field of biology that doesn't support the theory of evolution. And hundreds of articles each month are published by researchers in fields ranging from computer program to psychology to farming. And each paper contributes to the growing knowledge of the world around us. And it's tested in the real world. <coughs> evolution is not an abstract quest of concepts with no purpose, but rather it's <coughs> regularly utilized by working professionals to further the well-being of our society and our planet. It is used in designing treatments to slow the progress of weeds, pests, pathogens, evolutionary principles in the practical application, Henry Kinison, bioinformatics, a multi-billion dollar industry which consists largely of the comparison of genetic sequences. <coughs> Descent with modification is one of its most basic assumptions. Disease and pest evolve resistance to the drugs and pesticides we use against them. Evolutionary theory is used in the field of resistance management in both medicine and agriculture. Evolutionary theory is used to manage fisheries for greater yields. If artificial selection has been used since prehistory, but has become much more efficient with the addition of quantitative trait locus mapping. Knowledge of the evolution of parasites <coughs> in human populations can help guide public health policy. Sex allocation theory, based on evolutionary theory, was used to predict conditions under which the highly endangered kakapo bird would produce more female offspring, which retrieved it from the brink of extinction. And these successes, this is the important thing, 
these successes were built on the theory of evolution. They weren't built in and of themselves. They didn't come up from scratch. They weren't created in a moment. They go through a long lineage that was built, refined, tested on, all the way back to the origin of species. And then more work is used. It's built, refined, and tested upon to produce beneficial results for man and the planet. It continues hundreds of papers a month to this day. This is not a foreign process. We did the same thing with Copernican theory, which started with Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, built on by Edmund Haley and Isaac Newton. And then one day, we landed a probe on a comet and a rover on Mars. The process for all this measurable success <coughs> remains the same. Thoughts are hypothesized, tested. The old ones that fail to reproduce results are deprioritized, while those hypotheses that show results are used to develop new ideas which are then tested. And testing is important. That's how you know something works. And the theory of evolution is tested with every peer-reviewed article and with every experiment that uses it as a basis for trying the experiment in the first place. <coughs> and this process has been so successful that if you ask 275 professionals who work in a biology-related field, 274 of them rely on the theory of evolution to produce tested results. They are not foolish people. They are people who have seen the reliability of this theory and use it every day to impact our world. If the vast, vast majority of experts in the field use this theory to produce results in the real world and do so regularly, ask yourselves if being skeptical of something that has produced more rigor rigorously tested experiments and data than plate tectonics should be treated as though there were scientifically acknowledged challenges to it. If you still doubt, ask yourself if you do so because of well-informed skepticism or because of the data contradict, contradict a presupposition you hold. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. Uh, next we have Kevin Hubbard. Come on up. <laughs> what do you know? I've got a laptop designed by two guys named Steve. <laughs> well, how's everybody doing tonight? It's really great to be with all you guys. You know, the, the guy who gets to go last gets to back clean up. I guess that's part of the fun. And so I want you guys to know how, uh, how excited I am to be with all of you tonight. Um, we've heard a lot of interesting information from a lot of really, really bright people. And it's clear that their positions have been very well thought out. As for my end of things, I'm an oncologist, hematologist, hospice palliative care doc. I also chair a department of medicine at KCUMB, Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences. We produce the number, we produce the second most common number of physicians for both Missouri and Kansas. We're the 12th largest medical school in America. And uh, nobody's heard about us. And so, you know, people sort of think we work at a bank. So we got a branding issue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I will, I will tell you that any, any monies that I ever raise do go to feed needy children. Mine. <laughs> so I'm a practical guy. I'm a kind of person who looks at this as a bit of a pragmatist. And, and I tell myself, you know, this has to work. There has to be something that I can use, something that I can get out of this that's meaningful to put to use. And I don't think you want to have a hematologist standing up here giving you all sorts of big, long diagrams. This is one of this is my pharmacology professor, by the way, from, from school. If you're using no, it really isn't, but it looks a lot like him. Uh, that, you know, that gets kind of tedious. And the later on we get in the course of the evening, the more tedious it gets. And so we're not going to talk about a lot of big theoretical stuff because you know our, our brains are full of other things. I'm just going to take a very practical approach and talk to you about something that I deal with all the time. I'm going to talk about the human hemostatic mechanism and why I think it's an ex outstanding example of design. How important is it? Well, we're about to find out. I have just caused several dozen microfractures in the capillaries in the palms of my hands. <laughs> right now, if my hemostatic mechanism is up to snuff, there's something going on. 
that's absolutely incredible. Whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist, I hope by the time you spend about 10 minutes with me, you're really going to be amazed at what this, what this mechanism can do. Because if it's not working, I'm going to have a big problem on my hands. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so the cloning mechanism requires three major things. What it requires is a blood vessel lining that we refer to as the endothelium. So it's on the inside, we'll call it endothelium. It also requires platelets, little fragments of cells that float around in the bloodstream to help our blood to clot. And it requires clotting factors. What has to happen here is they all have to work together. And if we have problems with any one of those mechanisms, people bleed. Or they have accentuated clotting. Medical term for that is hypercoagulability. You may have friends or family members who, for whatever reason, have hypercoagulability and have to take blood thinners. You may have to see that all the time. We've got two components to this. We've got primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Pretty easy so far, right? So primary hemostasis means that the platelets circulate in an inactivated form until they come to one of those microfractures. Underneath that, yeah, underneath that endothelial lining is something called a subendothelium that has things that activate those platelets. Those inactivated platelets now become active, get together, and form a platelet plug. They just glom onto each other and just, just fill that in. It really is miraculous when you have a chance to take a look at it. After <coughs> that happens, we have to find a way to stabilize this whole thing. And so there is this network where the clotting factors come in, and they form a lattice work. Think about the inside. You know, if you go to the, go to the Sprint Center, or you have a chance to go <clears throat> to, a, to another indoor arena, you see this really, really complicated lattice work that goes in and supports the ceiling and all those structures. That's kind of what this looks like on the inside. This is where clotting factors are involved. And they also function to recruit additional platelets. And so if you were to set this whole thing in motion, it would look a little bit like this. See if I can get this thing to play. Oops. Yeah, here we go. So hopefully nobody gets motion sickness. So the clotting mechanism kind of gets started. And you see these nice little red discs. These are the red blood cells. The little fragments of things are the platelets. And they're all cruising along until they come to this spot. So this is what it looks like on my hand right now. I've got hundreds <coughs> of these, these holes that are going in. These platelets identify the problem. And see how they develop these little spines? They get activated. And then they begin to activate these clotting factors. These clotting factors are inactive. They become activated. And then they begin to activate each other one right after the other. There's a whole orderly sequence that goes on. And so here you see, here's an activated factor A, binding with another clotting factor, and then factor nine cleaves off another factor. Now the me actual mechanics of this are a little bit less important than the fact that all of these clotting factors are inactivated. They become active in serial. This whole thing moves down the line. It's a very, very ordered process. Very straightforward, and when what happens at the end of this is that you get this really nice lattice work. It, you know, it looks doesn't look real pretty. You probably wouldn't win any awards for for um, you know better homes and gardens or anything. But you can see how this tracks the blood, the red blood cells, and how this whole thing gets formed, and it just holds everything together. Very very complicated, but very very important. There's a couple of major points to take home here. Whoops. One too fast. I got that fastest finger thing going. First is that platelets and clotting factors are inactive. They have to circulate in an inactive form. If they didn't, your clotting mechanism would be constantly triggered. You'd bleed to death. There is a pathologic condition where that occurs, and people do bleed to death from it. Clotting factors are also activated <coughs> in a specific order. They also activate and control and regulate upstream and downstream as this process goes on in a specific order. Very, very carefully controlled. You have to limit progression of this, otherwise it can spin out of, out of control and you can have a problem. 
In addition to that, you kind of need to keep things neat in there because if you have clot that starts hanging all over everything, it can trigger more clots to form. We all know about Derek Thomas. Derek Thomas was a football player for the Kansas City Chiefs. Derek Thomas died of a condition known as pulmonary embolism. Derek had a clot that formed in his leg that traveled to his lungs. It was so massive it cut off the flow of oxygen, uh, to, uh, carbon dioxide to his lungs and oxygen out of his lungs, and he passed away as a result of that. This is a world-class athlete who died of a blood clot. So catastrophic things can happen if you don't control that. Well, as it turns out, we've got a clot barber. That clot barber is the plasminogen plasmin system, and it goes around and it kind of controls, trims up that fiber and lattice work so that it doesn't get too big. By the way, plasminogen is inactive. It becomes active at certain points through this process and then has the capability of turning itself off. Very, very complicated mechanism. So there's some questions to consider. How would you develop this from an evolutionary standpoint? I'm not saying evolution doesn't happen, okay? I'm just asking an honest question. I'm a pragmatic kind of guy. How do you develop that from an evolutionary standpoint? Another thing I'm trying to figure out, how do the proteins evolve in an inactivated form? How do they evolve to become activated to complete a specific step, and then they become deactivated <coughs> by steps down the line? If the proteins developed independently, where was their dependence integrated? At what point did that occur? How did it happen? Thirdly, how would platelets evolve the ability to become activated by the capillary endothelium? Something that it would never see <coughs> until, its, until its services were needed. How would you shut it off? Additionally, what's the statistical probability of over 15 separate proteins evolving in an inactive form activating one at a time in a prescribed sequence, deactivating by checks and balances throughout the system, interacting with activated but not deactivated platelets, and providing for its own regulatory processes by a separate panel of six to eight proteins, also inactivated, whose job it is to ensure when activated but not when deactivated, that the resulting clot is controlled, monitored, and subsequently removed. So you got to ask yourself, is there a way that we can take a look at this? Well, we all went to algebra in high school, right? When you were sitting in algebra class, you wondered, when will I ever need this? Guess what? Tonight's the night. <laughs> so if we look at that, Thomas Jukes, back in 1971, Dr. Jukes is a very hardcore theoretical evolutionist. He is an atheist. He believes purely, strictly in evolution. Made a very important comment. The probability of an existing sequence, protein sequence, having emerged by chance from the super astronomical number of possibilities for permuting 20 variables, those are the amino acids, into a sequence of more than 100 <coughs> units is almost infinitely small. This is an evolutionary biologist. This is an atheist who says it's almost infinitely small. So, how big are some of these proteins? Well, in factor two, prothrombin, there are 295 amino acids. Factor three, antithrombin, 432. Factor four, also known as platelet factor four, 70 amino acids. But factor five that we saw come into the picture, 2,224 amino acids. Factor seven, 406 amino acids. Factor nine, by the way, Christmas factor. Woohoo! it's that time of year, right? 461 amino acids. Let's look at a couple of others. Von Willebrand factor, 20 <coughs> cool protein. 2,050 amino acids in one unit. By the way, that's the monomer. They can merge into multimers and do very complex things. That would be several dozen units. We'll just leave it at 2,050 for the monomer. Plasminogen, 291 units. Now, remember, the likelihood of one protein with 100 amino acids occurring purely by chance is almost infinitely small. In fact, if you do the math, the likelihood that all of those things would happen less than 1 times 10 to the 100th power. Now, mathematically, anything that is less, less than 1 times 10 to the 50th power is considered mathematically impossible. If you remember 
This is a logarithmic scale. So when this number, it looks like it's twice, but in fact, it is a million, billion, 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 billion times past mathematically impossible. So what I'm left with, what I can conclude is that the likelihood that this occurred through evolution is way beyond mathematically impossible. It's way beyond mathematically impossible. So I have to consider the possibility that something other than evolution is responsible for creating this mechanism. Whether you want to call it intelligent design, if you want to call it God, whatever you want to call it, it really doesn't look like it's an evolutionary process. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. I want all my panelists to come on up here and y'all just sit up front and we're going to take some questions. If you can shut that. It's not over here projecting. We're going old school on it. I'm Billy Butler. This is going to be for someone else in here. <laughs> okay, at this time we have about 15, 20 minutes to take questions for you guys. So, right here. I have a question uh, for Fred. Does he believe that God created Adam and Eve, and if so, were they in a mature or a evolving physically? I know that the word Adam in Hebrew means human, and that uh, people like Josephus and uh, Philo and others were less literal than we are, many the way I was raised to be, looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as being a figure or something that was happening as important to make an important lesson to us about uh, our relationship to God and the way we broke that relationship. Um, the tree of life and so on, a talking snake. Um, I look at Adam as representing all of us. We have all disobeyed God. Paul speaks about him as being <coughs> a figure, or what's the word he actually used? It's a type of Christ. I see that uh, it's, not, it's not necessary to think in terms of a literal Adam because scientifically it's impossible. Um, we know going back far enough that if we're taking, if you do take Genesis, the first chapters of Genesis literally, you're going to see um, those first, uh, you're going to put, have to put Adam and Eve into a, a, a agricultural time, and there's a town there right away, and so on. So it's going to have to be a fairly recent Adam, and we know that humans were already dispersed all over the world <coughs> way before that. So for scientific reasons, and for, the, and for good exegesis reasons, I believe that it's unnecessary to believe in a literal Adam and Eve. So you do not believe that Adam and Eve were physically living on the earth? Um, only in the sense that I am, because I believe that I, you, we all represent Adam. We all have sinned and disobeyed God. We all have taken from that uh, fruit uh, and disobeyed <coughs> God's commands. And so in that sense, uh, it, it really is Adam, but it, it is us, all of us. I'm going to ask people to talk about more people back here. <coughs> sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, question to the creation side of things. Uh, would you guys say that you... Uh, that macroevolution can't happen, and follow up question that if you would say yes, then like if it were the case that you know say 100, 200, 300 years from now we're able to have some breakthrough where we actually watch a species <coughs> kind of change or evolve into another species, would that change uh, your thinking in terms of how you interpret macroevolution? Tell me what you mean by macroevolution. Well, I think what I mean is by the actual advent of a new species. You're saying that one species isn't sh switching to an entirely um, new species, or however you want to phrase that. You know, I think it depends on how you might phrase that. For example, it might be possible by discovery that we identify a new species. And uh, the coelacanth is probably a, a reasonably well-known uh, commodity for the last 40 or 50 years. It's been debated back and forth in evolutionary circles, but that was a species that had not been previously identified. So when we're talking about macroevolution, what we would want to talk about specifically is a new life form that had never existed before. Yeah, like I'm talking like birds being able to swim in the ocean, something like that. 
Yeah, that you know that'd be pretty cool. But, but would that change how you interpret? You mean penguins? I don't know that it would necessarily change my, my specific philosophical view, because you know if uh, because the creationists view God as creator. So if God can create anything He wants, any time He wants, it can happen. From an evolutionary standpoint. I'm open to the dialogue that we can all have together about how that might <coughs> happen. But so we're keeping an open mind about that. Um, let me add 30 seconds. Um, James, what he talked about when he talks about tests that have been done that, that have demonstrated evolution, I would disagree with him because I think today, uh, observing wise, I'm not aware of any tests that actually show macroevolution happening in the lab. I've never seen that tested empirically. Uh, Fred presented evidence that led him to that conclusion, but that wasn't observable by the scientific method. That's based on his investigative laying out a structure and coming up to that conclusion. So uh, that's where I would say if you could actually demonstrate <coughs> scientifically, which I think we haven't, I think that would be something that'd be very interesting. I don't think it's happened yet. Yes, sir. This is for the intelligent design component. Both of you went on pretty extensively about what you saw as processes that showed irreducible complexity. But neither one of you really addressed what Fred had brought up about vestigial organs and processes within the body that have no purpose being there if we were intelligently designed. And as you guys both you know, are Christians, a perfect designer would have no reason to include things like a tailbone or you know, an appendix in a human being and then the other side of that is that why would a perfect designer create the complexity of an eye or the homeo hemostatic uh, mechanism that you both described to be so complex that they can easily break down where people do need to take blood thinning, thinning drugs or are born blind because those mechanisms don't work. I think that's a great question. I'm going to stand up. But um, I've, I have always been interested in that kind of thing, and I really enjoy Alvin Plantinga when I watch him and he gives some explanations. And he said, you know, we have this thought that God somehow must be a scientist, you know. I think of him as I'm a scientist, and therefore when I look at a certain design, my immediate criticism is, well, if I see him as a scientist, I don't like his design, so he's not a good scientist. Alvin says, well, what if he's an artist? What if he's, uh, he likes uh, music and he likes artistic expression more than he does transfer functions laying out? You know, we're making, <coughs> we're making suppositions that says, if I see a vestigial organ, aha, imperfect, therefore, I'm using that information to say there's something wrong with the design. I go to an art gallery, I see something, I think it's two people smiling at me, it turns out to be a truck in a, in a street. I, and that, I don't look at it and say, well, it's not designed because I don't understand it. I look at it and say, well, it's obviously designed, but I still don't understand it. I can still come to that conclusion. Why don't you? Uh, I, yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, a, a lot of us are, are married. We have wives or we have, we have mothers or we have sisters. When we talk about a woman's intuition, there's Aww. just that extra sense that they sometimes seem to have. I can't find an organ for that. I can't find an area in the body that, that has that. But when my wife says, I got a bad feeling about this, I've learned to sit up and pay attention because she's almost always right about it. So there may be things that go on in the body, whether they are physical, which is somewhat easily measured, or non-physical, which is a bit more difficult to, 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 to measure, so to speak. But I still note that if I can't explain it, there may still be a reason why it's not there, why it's there, it's just that the reason hasn't hasn't developed itself yet and as far as the appendix goes my dad was a surgeon the appendix was put there so that he could send me to medical school <laughs> <laughs> yes sir um i think it's is your name jj yes hey jj hi um, you seem like a really nice guy um and i liked how you came out um, in your introduction um you said that there's a lot of evidence that um Fred and Ed had presented, and you know it almost seemed like you were giving credibility to some of those evidences. Um, and then in your example with the the ruler, where it's 270 to uh, <coughs> one, with the one person being the uh, 
creationist or whatever. Um, <clears throat> my question is, do you think uh, the the path <clears throat> to insight, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is is uh, on the wrong foot if it's not interdisciplinary? Because I noticed uh, Ed and uh, Ken, is it? Kevin. Kevin, Kevin sorry. Um, both had a statistical kind of argument or insight. I just want to know what do you make of these different competing insights and how do you harmonize and sort of deal with that? Well, I, one of the focuses of, that I didn't want my presentation on was a big evidence war. And that's, that's why I went off that way, because there's a massive amount of data. Like uh, your presentation, Kevin, on you know, the blood clotting process. Very fascinating. And in humans, when any of those aspects starts to break down, the system goes haywire very quickly. But dolphins clot blood just fine without having a factor 12. There are several animals that are missing some of those blood clotting factors and do not have a problem clotting blood. It is the way our system is designed because natural selection has specified those microprocesses to make that effective. With the example that both of them have given on statistics, I find uh, I'm not necessarily comfortable with that math because that math is, it, it, it operates under flat chance. Like if we took all of these possibilities from scratch, you do get this massive number of one, less than one to 10 to the 100th power, which is massive. Were I to pick the first person on my right here, Larry, handsome devil of a man, and ask him what his birthday is, he would tell me, 5'11", We'll just go with 5'11", May 11. And I went down the line, there's a one, a 1 in 365 chance that it would take for me to match that birthday. But if I had took his birthday, and then I took your birthday, and then I took your birthday, and your birthday, and your birthday, and your birthday, eventually I would find two birthdays that matched. Because I, f I find that uh, in the, the process of macroevolution that I found in, in all of these developing systems, you don't just have things that pop up out of chance. You have things that pop up based on other processes from which they borrow. And that radically increases the likelihood of an occurrence versus flat chance. So it's not that their data isn't real. I just have a different interpretation of it. Can I have a follow-up question? I would point out something, too. By the way, if you, if you are deficient in factor 12, you have Hageman factor disease. Those people do not bleed. They are hypercoagulable. They will clot and die. Interesting uh, disorder. Can I just have a follow-up question real quick? Is your probability, uh, Ed and Kevin, was your probability pure mathematics, or was it based on variables? James has got it wrong. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> when you do a one-time event where you're measuring independent events like he did, you can come up with that chance, but that's not how it's done. Statistics on processes are done in repetition. It would be like saying, the way I do statistics at work when they ask me solve problems, I can't take a bunch of data and say the probability of that guy's birthday needs some number that shows it's probable enough and therefore you should believe it. I have to repeat it in experiments. And this is what we do in science, and this is what blood clotting does. When he makes the comment by natural selection that you have certain proteins that coagulate in sequence, he can't show it mathematically happening. He just gave you a story without being able to prove it. When we run um, eyesight for 11 CTS retinal rhodopsin, the middle rhodopsin, we can run that experiment over and over and over again. When I run that experiment uh, 2.8 million times, and I get the exact same sequence in the exact same order independently in different eyeballs in different rooms anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and it happens over and over again, 10 times the 50th power is real because it's independent. The system functions the same way repeatedly over and over and over again. That's the power of statistics. It's independent testing that you observe and you see the same process happen. When I do that in a business, when they hire me to do that, they'll pay me because they know what they need to fix. I don't know if that helps. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I had a question, actually, a statistics question. Um, I thought it was really interesting, all your points about how it's so incredibly, like, 
And most of it was on how rare this would be or how statistically unlikely these, these things, these events are, the, the way the universe, the physical laws are. Um, what would be the likelihood of such a universe occurring naturally if there is an infinite number of universes, like most theoretical physicists believe? In an infinite number of universes, how likely would it for this, these anomalies to occur naturally? I think it will be too. Um, you want to go ahead? I, 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 I'll just say this. If I had an infinite number of um, ATM codes to get in other people's machines, I would never be broke. But I don't. You see, so this is what we would call wishful thinking, where we would come up with a hypothetical and say, if the hypothetical existed, then that would work. And we can do that all the time. But we got to go with the evidence of how things really work. That would be my two cents. I'm really yeah, I would. I would agree with that. I, you know, I think it's <clears throat> the concept of a multiverse is really fascinating. But I also think we struggle with what to do in this universe. You know, we've got a lot of unanswered questions, and before we start complicating it by saying, well, you know, what about this and what about that and what about the other? Why don't we just take a look at the at the dilemmas that we currently have? You've got. You've got four people up here who look at very similar information and come to different conclusions. So we, we clearly have enough to talk about in the universe in which we live, and we still haven't adequately explained it. Now, as far as a multiverse would go, there's essentially you know an, a, an infinite number of me's, an infinite number of you's. My wife is probably trembling in her boots right now, so I, I haven't figured out what to do with the one I got. Um, and probably most otherwise are doing that with their husbands too, you know, <laughs> because of the, the complexity that gets involved, it begins to boggle the mind. And the problem that we have is that we still struggle with the mathematics, the, the uh, <coughs> physics, we struggle with all of those things because it's mostly theoretical. So those are the things that I think we really struggle with as we look at the multiverse concept. So I'm just saying, if we believe that if, if it is true, if, the, if there, we don't know, if there is multiple universes, if that's true, would you say that the universe could exist naturally like this, even if the odds are low and an infinite number of them exist? Well, I think you're still, you're still going to have a situation where you have to decide, do the laws of physics apply? Do the laws of biology apply? Do the rules that we've seen in our own universe apply in other universes? And you're, you're, you and I would have different viewpoints, and yet we'd both be right, we could both be wrong. There is simply no way to know for sure. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so I have a question relating to, uh, you guys have given a lot of stuff that goes towards an argument of intelligent design, um, but it was posed as actually like, creationist versus evolutionary position. Um, and the gentleman over here mentioned Adam and Eve. And I was curious if you were working from a position uh, of um, the Earth being relatively new in the last 10,000, 6,000 years position versus um, what Fred presented was a lot of historical uh, 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 fossil evidence uh, that uh, over right. millions of years. Right. Now, I was curious uh, <coughs> if you were going by that literal interpretation of the Bible with Adam and Eve starting rather recently or more uh, long-term approach. I, I, I was trying to get your two positions on that. I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'm more of an older guy. Kind of. I, I, for me, when I look at the evidence that we have in science, and I look at um, Genesis, I struggle. There's tension there with the word yom and how it applies. And we see, um, we see verses, especially in the Ten Commandments, which sure sound like 24 hours. And then you find a verse that sounds like eras and long periods of time. And, and then I look at the scientific evidence, and you know. For me, I lean more towards an old earth interpretation. Yeah, I, I would say I do too. You know, one one day I, I look at it and I say, you know, I can find some evidence that it's a young earth. The next day I get out of bed and look at the same thing and go, yeah, I think I'm kind of an old earth kind of guy. I think the reality is I don't know. And I think that's an honest statement. As scientists then do you ascribe to, he was asking earlier about Adam and Eve for Fred. Do you believe everything started with one man, one woman? And then how does replication, how does that even work genetically? Because you guys are talking about science and genetics and how that works. I don't understand the math, the science of that. Well, you have to get into a little bit of the theistic explanation, uh, I think, if you do that. So um, if you presume that God is infinite and that he is in control, then you have to assume that he would have the capability of working through some of that stuff early on. I think we also have to recognize that that we were originally born without sin. 
and the things that we have that we deal with and as, a, as a component of humanity, the genetic issues that we have, our health problems, the, our duration of life, and all of the things that we have to deal with are components of a sinful nature. So Adam and Eve were, were conceived before the fall of man from original sin. How long they were alive prior to that episode is a little bit unclear. I don't think the scriptures point clearly one way or the other in that regard. So it's possible that while they described Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel were born after the original sin occurred. How many children were around before that? Nobody knows, and admittedly, we're, we're kind of out on the edge making some guesstimates. But I have to think that a God who could make all of this happen probably has a way to make the genetics work out initially. But you're right. If we look at it through the window of what we know in the 21st century, it makes very little sense that Adam and Eve alone could be able to conceive the entire human race just based on that. And let's remember something else. If we still apply the theistic component to this, there was a worldwide flood that wiped out everybody but Noah, his wife, and their three kids and their wives. And so, you know, still we're dealing with a very small human gene pool. And yet, look at all the diversity we have around us. Yes, sir. Okay, I have a question for Fred. And where did you get those boots? Definitely winning the shoes competition. And a little, and, and a little bit of a question for you. Too. That's it. The, the boots. The, the, that's, that's all I got for Fred. Oh, <laughs> um, the, there seems to be, it's it, you, you say wishful thinking when you talk about the multiverse. You know, we don't want to take that leap, but you want to say my blood clot. Therefore, something just made me. When you know we see suns, we know there are other suns. We see planets, or other planets, other universes. We theorize that. We can at least try and conceptualize that. But we have no conception of this God. Mm -hmm. I just think it's if one's wishful thinking, the other is extremely wishful thinking. Let me, let me, That's all. I just think, I, in other words, I think you're. I, I hear you. And you, you know, know what? You're making a good point. You're not balanced. But, to be honest, where I'm coming from is, um, I think. The example of blood clotting in the eye, the things that you see, rules out unguidedness. So I'm not using those to say, aha, there's a God, look at blood. I'm saying that when I, and it's the same thing. That's what I thought I heard. No, not at all. Not at all. What I'm saying is, when I look, when I look as a scientist in the work I do, one of the things I use is screening DOEs, design of experiments where you screen out factors, and you're looking for ways to tell whether something has a causal relationship in one direction or not. So when you look at blood clotting or, or this, these mechanisms, you can clearly screen out an unguided process because it's, aper it's operating mechanistically in a transfer function where one triggers the other, they're lined up. And they repeat that, <coughs> and this is the statistics, they repeat over and over again no matter where they are and they're independent. So that leads me to say it can't be Unguided. Well, are you saying unguided like uh, like God couldn't just press the button go and then the process take off as in kind of Fred's? I, 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 I'm sure you believe in theistic intervention, but are I'm you saying still asking me. Yes, I am. So in, in other words, your 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 conception of, of reality is God is pulling strings constantly to make no. things happen. No. So he can just he can just he can just set the press the button. Create the program, press the button, and then the program can go. I actually think what's happening is as we look at the science, you're bringing God in. What I'm saying is as I look at the science, I'm unable to go the direction of unguidedness or natural explanations. As Kevin said, I'm a Christian. James and I had a good discussion on this. He asked me, are you a presuppositionalist? Yeah, there are times I am. There are times I, I don't know and I'm supposing some things because I simply don't have the evidence. So what these things do for me is they screen out naturalism as an explanation, and then I show Bible verses. They, they point me personally to God, but I definitely don't use them as proof. I'm just trying to see the distinction, like if, you know, like it's almost as if you want to say that lots of things seem to be evolving, but there are things that don't, that don't, aren't capable of evolving, it's too improbable. And then that's where God comes in and, and kind of turns the corner on that thing or something. But I, otherwise, I, he's unnecessary, it seems to me. Yeah, so I, in other words, I, I feel like it's an injection of something into a system when he could have easily just said go 
and the system could have operated just like we observe it. And, and I'll, I'll end with this. Because I'm not trying to eliminate God from the equation. No, 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 I'm not at all. I'm wondering where you're putting him. What I said was I was very skeptical of macroevolution. So I didn't say I agree with the evolution I see or it, or it has merit. I actually don't see a lot of merit for me in what Fred presented, and that is not saying, <laughs> hey, that's not saying I don't think Fred is really bright, and he's done a lot of work to show evidence that he says points in a direction of life's development. I'm saying personally, as I evaluate it, it's forensic, it's after the fact, and I think it's much more powerful to look at things that I can observe that operate. So therefore, I'm skeptical of the macro part, but I'm very compelled by the, the experimental equations on how life really works. Okay, we've got about five minutes, but I do want to uh, encourage you, if you have kids and they're down in the nursery, go pick those guys up, or in kids' ministry, go pick them up right now so that uh, we don't get... Uh, Can we stay till quarter after? Is that okay with everyone? If you don't yeah. have kids? Yeah, if you don't have kids, feel free to stay as long. All right, let's take a uh, question over on this side. Um, my question is for JJ. I think you did a good job. You're really theatrical, and I like that. Um, <laughs> but well, my question is, um, you gave a lot of statistics that were great that showed us that a lot of scientists um, find evolution to be true and apply that in their work and why their work is credible, and that's really cool. Um, but I think... Everyone else kind of gave an example of, even if it was kind of an out there example of why it convict, why their beliefs convicted them. And so I kind of wanted an example of you, what in evolution just really just makes you say, just really hits you hard, even if it's completely random, just really hits you hard and really convinces you, this is exactly how it is. And this is so crystal clear. Um. Well, that, that would imply that I'm 100% certain that evolution is correct, and I'm merely certain by fiat. I think the data better supports macroevolution than does not. One of the things, that, and there are things that really sell me on it. For example, there's, and I would have to go back and look at the data. I spent two years doing this, and now it's it kind of set my concept. And that's why I approached it originally from that conceptual point. Why do I continue to conceptualize the theory of macroevolution rather than going and revisiting the data and revisiting the data? Some things that make me sure are the uh, example of the chromosome that is split between the ancestor, that is split in uh, the ancestor of a uh, human, like a hominoid ancestor. At some point, that chromosome fused, and they've been able to trace that genetic lineage. Another example is the indigenous retroviri that are found in uh, the lineage of humans but aren't found in, they're found in other kinds, as they would say, but they aren't found in other kinds, say dogs. There's a point where you can mark that this happened in the common ancestry and follow that like a trail of breadcrumbs. I, uh, there are things like, he talked about uh, the uh, eye, and I, like I just, took time, I read like the papers by Doolittle and Aaron talking about how these different uh, proteins you know, interdeveloped and uh, was uh, really sold on, I watched as papers came out supporting the different parts of evolution for the bacterial flagellum, <coughs> where it used to be a very major creationist argument for irreducible complexity. And at one time they barely had an explanation for any of the proteins on the flagellum. And now, the I believe there's 42 on one, the uh, E. coli, I have to look it back up, but they've explained all but two of them and have a, given them a relationship in the cell and shown a potential pathway for how they move from an old function to a new function. And I, as I said, I'm not 100% certain, but there's a significant amount of data that I've come across, like way more than the 15 minutes we had for me. <laughs> I mean, we consider yeah. all of us have <laughs> We all have a massive amount of examples to support the position we've developed. What I wanted to illustrate was why those, not so much the specific examples that sold me, but rather why I continue to support it is because of that wide-ranging success that the theory was. Yes, sir. 
I've got two, I think, relatively short questions. <coughs> you, you've traveled the world, you've seen evidence held in your hands of uh, the, the evidence for what you believe. Do you find that, uh, that the rest of the world has a hard time accepting evolution, or is it really chronic just to the United States? I mean, statistically, you can look and see that it is the United States that has a greater, there's certain places, and there you can list them by countries, surveys that have been done, certain Muslim countries, particularly in Saudi Arabia and others, I believe, that have um, significant <coughs> people that have problems with buying evolution. Essentially, the United States is highly correlated to religious fundamentalism. Right. 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 And I think the second question is, is, uh, is actually to address to the two gentlemen on the end here. Um, if you accept a geological time scale, and you accept microevolution, what is it that prevents you from making a jump to accepting macroevolution, and is it just irreducible complexity? I think, I guess I would answer that question on the question, and, and I'm going to step out of the way and, and, and let Ed answer. In order to get from where we, from the start, and you know, and I think I think the bulk of scientific evidence really supports the concept that time, space, and matter had a start. Call it the Big Bang, call it the origination, whatever you want to refer to it as. How far back do you go in order to explain all of this? When I was in college 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago, we thought that the universe was about five billion years old. As we've learned more, and as we've built on the the evolutionary construct to this. It's now 10, 15, 20 billion years of age. So how far back can we go? So the question that I have about being able to explain a geological construct in this is, how far back are we going to go? What's the right answer? Because it, it keeps changing. Now, part of that is science. We just keep digging for answers, and, and we keep pushing it back. That's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as we're honest and open about it and saying, yeah, I'm not really sure I know what the answer is, but it appears that if we're going to follow along with pure Darwinian evolution, we're going to probably need more time than we've already allocated. So from the geologic time frame that seems to be universally accepted within science of the Earth being 4 billion years old, it's not enough time to make the jump from microevolution to macroevolution. Is that what we're yeah, I think, and I think you, you made a good comment. It seems to be universal. Um, because well, I think. Well, I'm generous with that. I'm not trying to be Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a very appropriate thing to do. We don't want to we don't want to beat up the geologist, and we don't want to beat up the biologist trying to explain how we got here. I think we want to make sure that we understand what it is that they're trying to say. <coughs> and what they're trying to say, as I look at the literature, and as I look at the dialogue that goes on in that community, is gosh, you know, we're really not certain. Some of us think it's four and a half billion years. Some of us might go five. Others of us might go three and a half. There might be others that could go 10 and 20. So I, there, this isn't something that has an ongoing dialogue within that component of the scientific community. And if, if they don't know, that's okay, as long as they're honest about that. Fred, you're shaking your head over here, man. You get a response? Uh, it hasn't, <coughs> there was a time, you're right, when it was looked at it be about five. But the consensus now is that we're talking more about this is this is not having anything to do with evolution. This is NASA and uh, people on yeah, any side of those issues, again, biology, where we're talking about um, the, the big shift that happened recently was, I think, because of a probe that went up there was testing for this particular question of the age of, of the universe. And uh, it looked like we're talking about um, 13. Point seven, and now I believe it's closer to 13.8. But nobody's saying 15 or, or 20. So it's not like it's going on and on. And it's a, a subjective thing. Everybody's got a different opinion. Yeah, but it is longer than it used to be. Yes, about yeah. 5 to 13.8. All right. All right, six thousand. I'll give a quick answer. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get to your point. Scientists have three ways to test it. There's only really three ways to do it. You can take historical evidence that already exists, and you can try to um, use it to make causal explanations. This is what Fred's doing. He's, got, he's gathered a lot of information of fossils and he's put together after the fact to try to build uh, the evidence that points in a direction for a conclusion. You can build computer simulations and you can actually do design of experiments where you can build a simulation to try to get the results you want to try to see if you can design it and then test it. And then you can actually observe it in the laboratory. You can actually run experiments, cause and effect relationships to see if you get the effects from the causes. We've never done a laboratory experiment that's <coughs> changed the species. Now, if we have, I'd love to know. That would be good. 
So the laboratory experiment part doesn't fit scientifically. But there may be simulations out there. Somebody send me the papers because I'd love to see them. And historically, yes, you can. That's exactly what Fred's done. And from it, he's come to that interpretation. It simply isn't good enough for me as a scientist. Well, the question was, is it only your complexity that keeps you from making the jump from macro just, to macro? I just told you what it was. I'm a skeptic because we cannot test it in a lab. We can't actually observe it happening. So therefore, it's not scientific by the definition of science we'd like to teach kids in our schools. That's what we want to teach them is a scientific method. So I'm skeptical because I've never actually observed it or seen it. But I guess where I'm having a hard time is if, if your worldview is creation, none of that evidence is persistent for creation. So why are you accepting one route versus say the other because of the scientific um, requirement you have for evolution? You're not applying it seemingly to your current. Well, yes, I am. What I'm saying is when I go ahead and I look at the way biochemical systems work, I can test it in the lab. I can actually do it. I can see that um, Higgin factor 2, when it's at a blood clot location, actually activates and turns on prothrombin. I can actually watch it repeating itself consistently in a lab over and over again. But that, that's not testing your, your hypothesis. I, I mean, that's testing blood in the, in the capacity that you're talking. But I'm talking about you're testing your paradigm or your worldview. It seems you're holding the evolutionary worldview to a different standard than the creationist worldview. And you're using irreducible complexity to justify that. And, and, I, and I apologize because we're going over, but sure. I didn't mean that. That certainly isn't what I mean to do. Again, when we, <coughs> when we talk about presuppositions, sure. creation is one where it requires some faith. I mean, I wasn't, sure. I wasn't there. <laughs> so I look at the evidence, and the conclusion I've drawn is creation fits for me, and I'm, I'm taking that element of faith to get there. I'm strictly, we're strictly, I think, here talking about science. I presented the three methods where you can test a hypothesis. When you test the hypothesis for three methods, macroevolution fails for me. The one that passes, the one that makes sense is what Fred does. It's not convincing. That's what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Yes. First off, before I ask, I apologize. I was late, so if this has already been covered, I apologize for asking if it's already been. But my question would be, one, does, do you believe, to whoever wishes to answer, do you believe evolution is still occurring now? Again, I was late, so I apologize if this has already been covered, because I do have a follow-up question to that, whichever, whoever wants to answer, because I don't remember everyone's viewpoint. <laughs> when you say evolution, tell me what you mean. Tell us what you mean I would when you generally, say evolution. Okay, that would not be better answer. I would generally mean as to say our species as a whole, not like saying within a few months or a few years, but as in over generations of time, generations of time still evolving to either adapt to new circumstances that arise, such as climate or humans trying to kill them off for whatever reason, or just, I guess in a sense that would be, well, I guess that would be natural selection, but. Okay, so if I get, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just want to make sure I understand. Yes, what sir, you're sir. talking about is microevolution, in that there are changes that can occur within a species that, when acted upon by an outside environment, result in improved survivability for that species. And, and I think, I, I don't have any trouble with that at all, because I, we see that. Um, okay. We see microevolution occurring all the time. I can see microevolution when I'm treating patients who have infections, and that infection learns to become resistant to the antibiotics we have available. That's a form of microevolution. Now, it's mediated by different mechanisms in certain cases, but that's a form of microevolution. Okay, because in the question that I had, because I wanted to make sure that wasn't already covered before I asked that. Um, so then, in that case, then that would mean there would be a point, like, say, like for example, the giraffe example someone gave when I first came in here about how a giraffe could have started off not with such a long neck, or was that, I don't want to get that wrong in case I had that wrong, but it wasn't as long as it is now, say, however many years ago, it was much shorter of a neck, right? So if that's the case, then when there still be <coughs> like in between species, or like somewhat like say a draft that's neck is half as long 
like would that why when those animals or species still exist today for I guess like the general the general main example is like the common thing you know people say people agree or disagree on whether humans evolved from apes or not and if that's the case <coughs> or here humans are here so where's in between but I just want to make sure that wasn't already discussed before I asked that question just a real quick answer yeah. um, again if you look at just anatomy and we talk about the length of the neck or you know something that more morphologically is different the biochemical systems still have to match that that animal or that that being so um, again what I was demonstrating is how do you get the requirement of a heart that large that you need for that type of a structure to just slowly start creeping along to get to where it, we can keep that animal alive because he has a long neck and then the attenuation device within the neck so that the blood doesn't blow, it, blow up the giraffe. So it's more than just looking at a structural homology change, it's the entire systems that have to change to give you what you get. Does that happen and do we observe it and measure it? Haven't heard of any yet. So how does Fred address that? Well, I propose a question here, Fred. Go. Yeah, I'm just going to try to uh, ask a question to Kevin and Ed that might help to get to the crux of what the differences really are between us. And, and that has to do with the, the whole nature of the power of God, how powerful God is, or how limited he might be, or what way he might express his power. My question is, since I've heard Kevin say a number of times, how could this protein or this plate, this amino acid do this or that, and similar things, my question would be, how could God make the protein or the platelet or the amino acid do this or that? How are you saying God did it? Because um, it, did God do it to be a, like a you know, wizard-like proof? Would that be more God-like for you? Or would him using processes we can see in nature be um, count as God's handiwork? I don't know that I would necessarily tie God's hands, so to speak. I think it could happen by whatever means he chose. You know, if you, if you believe that there is a creator, then that creator is given the right to, to create by whatever mechanism he chooses. Um, so I think the short answer is, I don't know how to do it. I, you know, I know what I can see and what I can touch and what I can feel. And I find it difficult based on the mathematics to explain how it could have just developed. But that doesn't mean that he could not have used evolution as a tool. Uh, I just am unable to identify evidence in this particular situation that would be supportive of that. But how it happened, I don't know. Because I would then just recommend openness toward the possibility that God could have used evolution therefore to study some books on evolution to see if that would uh, be truly as limiting to God as some people might think, or if it might actually require a God with more intelligence, super intelligence beyond intelligent design type ways of thinking of God's right. And my hunch is maybe Ed, you got into this last time, and it's the concept of looking at at ways that things can happen. You know, things can happen uh, by by chance, or it can happen. And, and Ed gets into some of this in his in his classes about God versus random events versus other things. And I would completely agree with you. You don't want to take anything off the table. You want to leave the possibilities open because. Really, if you know, if God is real, if He exists and, and He's honest, He wants to be known. Uh, he doesn't want to hide Himself, and so through that process, we're either going to be able to understand that, or we're not going to be able to understand it. But we don't want to do it by taking it off the table and completely discounting it. To me, personally, that's academically fallacious. That's time for one more question. I saw a hand back there. Go for it. No, you, that's you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so let's say I got for like homeostasis in the giraffe's neck and part. Uh, we, we got you a paper next year or something that totally explained it. And you read this paper, you're like, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, cool. That's how it happened. Totally naturalistic. You read it, and you're like, all right, cool, that's how it happened. I'm going to guess you don't become an atheist. <laughs> and if that is the case, that we totally explain everything you want to know about those processes, and it turns out totally naturalistic, you still identify as a Christian, why spend so much time saying, you know what, it sure looks like all this other stuff evolved, but not this one thing here, as opposed to saying, you know what, I'm a Christian, I think God did it through evolution like Fred believes in, 
Let's go with that. Why spend all the time trying to nitpick the tiniest areas in contradiction to literally universal acceptance by experts in the field? David, cut it out, man. You did this last time. <laughs> I, I don't want to live. I got four kids. I'm busy. I'm really busy with my life. I don't spend my time trying to figure out ways to debunk evolution. I don't. What this was all about was bringing you in here and getting us together so we can talk. So we can talk. That's what this is about. I'm just sharing with you where I'm coming from and what I personally see and how I feel. Right? I'm not out there carrying signs saying if you're an evolutionist, you're going to hell. I'm not doing any of that. I, I don't think a person in our church, if they said, to, had Fred's position, I believe in evolution, but I love Jesus Christ, I don't think we'd say, oh, get out, you're a heretic. All right? So evolution is just a theory that's been proposed on life's diversity that I'm skeptical of. That's all. That's all it is. If naturalistic explanations came along, the naturalistic explanations are not the foundation for my beliefs. They're not. Now, if somebody found the bones of Jesus Christ and came out here in a wheelbarrow and you really didn't rise from the dead, I'm in trouble. That, that would be difficult. I could think of something that would hurt, would be painful for my belief system. So I don't ever want to think evolution is something I live or die over, because it's not. Any other closing thoughts before we dismiss? One more question, maybe? If y'all don't have any closing thoughts, I guess we can just go with one more. Go um, for it. Okay, I, I have a question for Fred. The Bible's gotten integrated here a little bit, so, so let me just come out and blatantly ask the question. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5 that through one man sin and death entered the world. And according to a theistic evolutionary standpoint, sin and death is required for millions and millions of years before humankind is even on the earth. So will you acknowledge that you are either against the Apostle Paul, or do you not believe that he is making the statement that he is in, in Romans 5? I agree that Hebrews, the Hebrew language in Genesis 1 is vague, and it's not clear, but I think we have a clear text in Romans 5 where Paul does take Adam and one man literally, and, you're absolutely and, and right. so we speak to that. Romans 5, that is the, probably the big, most problematic verse in the Bible for my position regarding Adam. And, and uh, so I don't have a great answer for you, but I do have the ponderance of the evidence over the rest of Scripture. Certainly the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not something to go by and try to be too literal, but we get our whole idea of biblical hermeneutics by the guy who really wrote the book on biblical, biblical hermeneutics called Biblical Hermeneutics uh, back in the turn of the century. So it wasn't too much into back in the turn of the last century before last, about 1900, um, Milton Terry, who said the first 11 chapters of Genesis were really all about um, looking exactly like what we find in in Revelation and Ezekiel, the, the numerology being important and so on, that this looks like uh, biblical apocalyptics, the, the genre. When you want to do careful exegesis, you want to ask yourself, what is the genre, the literary genre being used here? So when it comes to Romans 5, it's problematic. I can't get around it. I know um, Dennis Lamoureux, who speaks, who's got triple, three, three doctorates, and one of them is in theology and one of them is in uh, biology. Um, addresses that same problem. I, I recommend the book to you, um, I Accept Jesus and I Accept Evolution. I love Jesus, I love evolution, I think his name is the book. And see what he has to say about it. He goes into some great detail in Romans 5. In short, my answer is, um, the Apostle Paul was probably under the impression of a worldview that would have required pretty much an individual, personal Adam, a historical Adam. But his argument doesn't hinge on that. His, the his theology doesn't hinge on that. And certainly we can all be, um, coming, we can all be, um, without being biologically related to Christ, we can all reap the benefits of Christ's work for us, even though we aren't biologically related to Christ, same way with Adam, so, so his work, so, so um, Paul's analogy still works. Awesome. Any other thoughts from my family? Y'all give these guys a round of applause. so much for coming. I know it's getting late, so uh, you are dismissed. <laughs>